Whenever you talk about inequality in terms of any statistics between black and white, it's immediately chalked up to racism. And if you cite the fact that, for example, there's more violent crime in the black community than there is in the white community intraracially, uh, not interracially, intraracially, then this is somehow chalked up to the result of racism. Hey everyone, so here we have a clip of Ben Shapiro, and luckily for all of you, it will be his only clip in this video. In this clip, Ben is denying the existence of systemic racism and stating that all inequality that is observed within black communities is their own fault. He really tries to beat around the bush about this, but in the end, that is exactly what he's trying to say. His best solution for reducing inequalities are to get married or get a job. Such great advice, Ben. Thank you so much. Anyways, this led me to make a video about a historical example of systemic racism, and that is the crack epidemic, and describing how ideas of biological determinism, which were spewed by race scientists, were underpinned in governmental policies when responding to the crack epidemic. This will show how systems or institutions can perpetuate inequality that leaves an individual with very little choice in their life. So let's take a look at some history. The crack epidemic was understood to be at its peak during the 1980s, where there was an increased use of it in various cities of the United States. The main cities with widespread use of crack were New York, LA, and Detroit. This was a period in which the president at the time, Ronald Reagan, decided to move many factories out of urban areas. This resulted in the loss of many jobs. We'll go more into this later. For many people that struggled to find employment, selling crack was an alternative means to making money. The main method for countering the crack epidemic was by having an increasingly tough stance on drugs. This is also known as the war on drugs. The rationale behind this was that people would see tough punishments and avoid distributing or using drugs. This led to mass incarceration, where many small drug dealers were given increasingly harsh sentences and placed in prison for many years. For instance, from 1980 to 1997, the incarceration numbers for non-violent drug offenses increased from 50,000 to 400,000. Instead of trying to find real solutions for the issues of drug use and drug distribution, the governmental agencies showed zero empathy or humanity. They just threw people in jail and never discovered the root problem. They never attempted harm reduction policies that could have alleviated many problems and saved many lives. They just implemented harsh policies blindly, and we're seeing the consequences of this today. It is important to understand that the black community was impacted the most by the responses to the crack epidemic, and were on the receiving end for the harsher sentencing associated with crack and its possession. Biological determinism is the idea that all aspects of human behaviors are determined by their genes. Of course, historically, this idea was utilized to express racist tendencies within science. This meant that biological determinism would be used to justify that certain races were determined to be inferior of the white race. Scientists would conduct various experiments to show how the white race was superior. A great depth of these experiments can be seen in the book Mismeasure of Man by Stephen Jay Gould. Gould describes the significant flaws within each experiment in this realm of study. For instance, scientists would measure brain size by taking skulls, placing a type of grain into it, and then they would weigh it. The heavier the skull would mean the greater the intelligence. Now the racist aspect of this is that certain scientists such as Samuel Morton attempted to use these experiments to show that the brains of black people and other races such as Native Americans were smaller than those of white people. When these experiments were later replicated by other scientists, the results showed that there was no difference between skull or brain size of black and white people. When this methodology did not provide scientists with the results they wanted, they decided to look at the forebrain region of the brain, which is associated with intelligence. Experiments conducted by Robert Bennett Bean showed that white people had a larger forebrain region, specifically the corpus callosum, than black people. However, when these experiments were replicated, the results showed no difference. They would make similar claims about skull size between men and women as well. In terms of race, certain scientists would go even as far as to classify other races as different species. When they realized that using craniometry to distinguish between race was a bunch of nonsense, the next stage was to use mental testing to show the superiority of the white race. To this day, we hear people go on about IQ and its ability to show who is intelligent or who is not. However, when you investigate the origins of the IQ test, you come to understand that the creator of the IQ test, Alfred Binet, did not have an intention of using the test to determine who was more intelligent or not. 
Rather, it was simply to determine who may need extra help. The IQ test turned into this crazy racist measure of intelligence as soon as it arrived into no other country but the United States. H.H. H. Caudard brought the IQ test to the United States who stated that intelligence is the single entity that people are born with and there are rarely any environmental factors that can impact this. He further promoted the idea uh, that intelligence is associated with morality which means that the less intelligent you are, the less moral you will likely be. Wow, such morality being displayed by our high IQ overlords. So what does all this have to do with the crack versus opioid epidemic? Well, we come to understand that biological determinism is used to dehumanize other races. It is used to show that people from certain races were destined to be disparaged. These people were not innately intelligent enough to be successful. It was used to justify their inhumane policies of the past. For instance, look at some of Godard's proposals. He believed that people of low intelligence could not control their own sexual urges as the intelligent men can. So he decides that the best way to deal with such a situation would be to take all people of low intelligence and confine them to a single area. He basically wanted to create this type of colony for uh, people of low intelligence. Also, if someone was from a lower class or poor, it would be determined by people like Lewis Terman that they were destined to be that way because these people did not inherit intelligence from their parents, so that is why they are poor. If they were intelligent, then they would not be poor in the first place or from a lower social class. The same logic applied for a race, that if someone was Mexican or black for example, then there is no way that they could possess high intelligence simply for the reason that they are from that race. Terman believed that no environmental intervention can redeem people that have inherited this so-called intelligence, whether it was inherited due to their race or their social status. Terman's solution was very similar to other race scientists, that these people should be placed into separate classrooms because no form of education can help them. In terms of the crack epidemic, we can see similar dehumanizing arguments related to race that resulted in the significant neglect of these communities. This may indicate that policy differences associated with crack and opiate epidemic may have been based on the notion of biological determinism and its racist tendencies. It must be understood that this epidemic was fueled by the policies that were solely based on morality rather than a public health approach. The morality component of this approach was that these people doing these drugs were inherently bad. This type of drug scare was clearly propagated through the media. The media played a role in perpetuating paranoia around crack by stating that it was an addictive substances, although many people who did crack did not become addicted to the substance itself. The media also showed a perception that drug users were literally killing each other for the drug. When the violence was because of the trafficking of the drug, that was a direct result of the laws surrounding crack. Here we see the cover for Newsweek from March 17, 1986 of a young person smoking crack. The article even had an expert state that crack was one of the most addictive substances, which we know is not true. In this time, a new scare began. There was reporting that crack was starting to make its way into the suburbs. Where have we heard this line before? In the book Crack in America, Demon Drugs and Social Justice by Craig Reinerman and Harry Levin. They likened the idea of the drug scare to the era of McCarthyism in the United States, which was known as the Red Scare. They further argue how these types of tactics to combat drug use led to higher levels of drug consumption, which would also disproportionately impact black and brown communities. These tactics were evidently used by politicians and the media to detra detract people from the real social and economic problems that led to the epidemic in the first place. Instead of trying to deal with this crisis through legitimate public health policies and some basic humanity, they decided to throw the blame on drug users, drug dealers, and the drug itself. This is where the idea of pharmacological determinism comes into play. Pharmacological determinism is the idea that the drug molecule itself causes all the problems surrounding drug use. So an example of this can be seen from Nancy Reagan in 1988, where she would state that crack itself was responsible for societal issues such as crime and violence. American politicians at the time, whether they were Democrats or Republicans, were on full attack mode in their war on drugs. 
where instead of looking at their social policies that have contributed to the rise in crack use and distribution, they found a scapegoat which were the dealers of the drug and the users of the drug. This exact pattern of thinking was observed with the scientists that propagated biological determinism, where it was in no way the environmental factors that led people to have low scores on the IQ test, rather it must be some innate reasons for such results. Politicians and the media never considered social circumstances such as Reagan moving all the factories out of urban centers, which led to a significant loss of jobs. Many of these people did not have any job opportunities in the city. Reagan also decided to cut majority of social programs based on the narrative that the problem of drug using was based on people's own moral failures. This meant that no social program can reform people or aid them in any way. This was their destiny, which sounds very similar to the arguments of race scientists that we previously discussed. The only option for some to make ends meet was to start selling this new drug that came into town. It was complete governmental failure that facilitated this epidemic. However, that is not what was portrayed by the politicians and the media. They showed that there were these immoral people, usually minorities that were selling or using the drug, which resulted in violence and crime. These types of racist tropes of immorality or lack of civility were the same types of labels that race scientists would use to portray the inferiority of minority groups and people of low socioeconomic status. The media and politicians pushed biological deterministic arguments when it came to the crack epidemic, which further perpetuated negative stigma around crack. This led to political policies that instead of helping people who were vulnerable would simply demonize them. The saddest part of this history is that drug use was declining during the crack epidemic. Yet, such a significant amount of money, approximately $12 billion by 1991, was invested into the war on drugs, of which a vast amount was spent on increasing prison capacity. This overall resulted in what we know as mass incarceration. So let's take a look at some policies that resulted in this. But before we go into these policies, let's take a look at the difference between crack and powdered cocaine. It's really easy to confuse crack and cocaine. But crack is a solid form of cocaine that is smoked in comparison to powdered cocaine that is snorted or injected. Crack has more of a rapid but short-lasting effect. And crack produces feelings of euphoria in individuals that use it. And it's important to note that not everyone that smokes crack gets addicted to it. When we look at the sentencing for possessing crack, versus cocaine, we come to understand how racism and biological determinism are rooted in governmental policies. For instance, sentencing for possessing crack was much greater than it was for possessing powdered cocaine. This means that if you possessed 5 grams of crack, you would have a mandatory minimum 5 year sentence, while if you possessed 500 grams of cocaine, you would get the same sentence. The question that arises from this was that if these two substances are of the same origin, then why was the sentencing for crack to be higher than cocaine? The stats show that white people are more often sentenced for powdered cocaine, while black and brown people are more often sentenced for crack. This means that most often, black and brown people got tougher sentencing. I wonder what Mr. Facts Don't Care About Your Feelings has to say about this. Now we do understand that these two drugs have slightly different pharmacological effects, but are the same substances. There is nothing saying that one is more dangerous than the other. Therefore, we can rule out that crack did not have tougher sentencing due to it being more dangerous. It appears from this sentencing example that there is a ladder of morality where the most immoral person is the one who uses crack or distributes it. While the pharmacological impact of crack and powdered cocaine is almost the same, the only factor that makes sense is that these sentencing policies were rooted in racism which can be further understood by the idea of biological determinism. The people making these policies saw that crack was more prevalent in urban areas, which impacted both black and Latino communities. They clearly had preconceived notions about these communities being immoral. That is why we see the distinction in sentencing for crack versus cocaine. This disparity is further observed when we look at the opioid epidemic. Before we further go into this, let's go through what the opioid epidemic was. Opioids are substances that are used as treatment for pain. However, increasing the use of these substances can result in pleasure and euphoria. Examples of opiates are 
heroin, fentanyl, pharmaceutical drugs like oxycodone, and morphine. The most significant problems of opiates are that there is an increased chance of drug overdose that can lead to death. This is exactly what happened with the opiate epidemic. The opiate epidemic resulted from reckless prescription of opiates by physicians to patients that were experiencing pain. And these physicians would receive financial incentive from pharmaceutical companies for prescribing the drugs. This was an overall recipe for disaster. Doctors began to prescribe opiates left, right and center, which led patients to become dependent on them. Later increase in opiate deaths came from the use of heroin obtained from the streets. And the most recent uptick of opiate related overdose have come from fentanyl. So we must ask the question, did the government respond to this crisis the same way as they did to the crack epidemic? The answer is no. The response to the opiate epidemic was one of empathy. Drug addiction was no longer seen as this innate moral failure as it was by the Reagan administration. Rather, it was a medical issue. For instance, let's hear what Republican politician Chris Christie has to say. And we have to stop judging and start giving them the tools they need to get better. Many people believe that this empathetic response was due to the fact that the opioid epidemic mainly impacted white people from suburban areas. There were even memorials that were held for people that unfortunately died due to opioids. The same was never done for people that died due to crack. In the case of the opioid epidemic, there was evidently a clear public health approach that was taken. So how did the media handle the opioid epidemic? As we would expect, the media showed the victims of the opioid epidemic as these helpless white people that were suffering. A significant amount of sympathy was shown in this case. For instance, let's check out this New York Times article. Here we see an advocation for a more sympathetic approach. There is nothing about violence. There is no fear mongering, just images of people that truly suffered from their addiction. There is a call for a more forgiving approach to combat this problem. Basically the complete polar opposite of what was occurring in the crack epidemic. Let's see what a former undercover officer has to say. He says, the way I look at addiction now is completely different. I can't tell you what changed inside of me, but these are people and they have a purpose in life and we can't as law enforcement look at them in any other way. They're committing crimes to feed their addiction plain and simple. They need help. So the police officer has suddenly felt a change of heart when it came to his approach to dealing with people suffering with addiction. I wonder what changed this time. The fact that the media exemplified a more sympathetic approach to the opiate epidemic is simply because this epidemic impacted white people. That is all. There is no language of moral failure or personal responsibility anymore. Now it's societal factors that are impacting people. This is where we understand that the racist ideas of biological determinism are rampant in our society. Because when black or brown people are victims of anything, it's always pointed out that it's solely their fault and they did it to themselves. When white people suffer from something, then it turns into this crisis that was beyond anyone's control. To further add to this point, a study conducted by Netherland and Hansen in 2017 shows how the media has a distinctive portrayal of white people versus black and brown people when it comes to drugs. They looked at news articles in relation to drugs from the year 2001 and 2011. The results of this showed that news reports associated with black and Latino people strictly focused on crime, arrest, and names of people involved. When it came to news reports of white people and drugs, there was an immense focus on it being something totally new and shocking despite the fact that drug taking patterns between these racial groups are historically the same. For white people, they would go to the backstory of each person's life and how they started using drugs. The same was not observed with black or brown people, rather they would always link it to some sort of deviance or crime. We would never hear about exactly what led a person to start using or distributing the drugs. As mentioned previously, the media would direct us to the arrest made and how much drugs were seized. This example once again leads up to the point of morality and personal responsibility. When it comes to black and brown people and their relation to drugs, it's always connected to lack of morality and personal responsibility. But for white people, the blame never lies on themselves. 
That's when we start looking at environmental context and factors in their lives that led to these unfortunate situations. There are similar narratives for people that are well off that use drugs such as Ritalin and Adderall, which in reality are literally stimulants and are considered narcotics with the same potential of abuse as methamphetamine and cocaine. When we see stories associated with these drugs, it's usually seen as these professionals that do these drugs to increase their performance in work or studies. There's always a positive spin to it. So when we hear people like Ben Shapiro state that systemic racism does not exist and that simply getting married or getting a job can reduce inequality, the crack epidemic is a primary example in history that depicts systemic racism and the clear negative consequences that it has today and that ideas from biological determinism lay the groundwork for systemic racism. So that's all that I have to say. Uh, I want to thank you all for listening and watching the video. And uh, if you liked it, please like it and subscribe. And uh, hopefully I'll make some more videos.